How do we understand the problematic reaction to critical race theory in America? Welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. In this episode, we discuss critical race theory, wokeism, racial prejudice, and discrimination in our society and internationally. We're going to play for you an interview we conducted with Dr. Henry Richards. Henry Richards, Ph.D., is a licensed clinical psychologist with over two decades of experience in the evaluation, assessment, and treatment of individuals in forensic and correctional contexts. He has managed large forensic and correctional programs and provided training and organizational consultation to states, counties, hospitals, as well as residential and outpatient programs. He has specialized experience and training in addictions, sex offender issues, and methodologies of personal and organizational transformation and change. And Henry is also a novelist. Here's the interview with Dr. Richards. Henry, welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. Hi, Henry. Good to be here. Uh, hey, thank you for being our guest once again. It's a pleasure to have you back on our show. Henry, the subject of this episode is critical race theory, which has become a trending issue in the news, especially regarding its usage in K-12 through school discussions. According to the Associated Press, there is little to no evidence that critical race theory itself is being taught to K-12 through public school students though some ideas central to it, such as lingering consequences of slavery, have been taught. However, many states have proposed passing legislative bans on CRT teachings. These states include Florida, Texas, uh, Idaho, et cetera, et cetera. So would you basically fill us in, what is critical race theory and why is it being banned? Well, I think that this topic is difficult because the discussion of it has become not coherent or incoherent. Well, I'm glad you said that because I thought it was me. (laughs) No, I don't think. I think it's everybody talking about it. And I think that CRT is outmoded and unuseful as the old CRT screens. It's something (laughs) old. Uh That's a good good, one. It's actually something that dates back to the 1970s, like those big screens, and almost the concept to the 1950s. Mm. But basically is this idea that we can approach racial issues in our society critically, which means comprehensively and systematically to understand where it came from, how it works, how it's perpetuated, what could change about it, how could it best be changed? And it's just from that point of view, it sounds pretty innocuous. And originally there were a group of legal scholars who developed this idea of critical race theory to support various claims in court and also to show how the legal system itself and laws themselves are not race neutral that they tend to have strong racial biases. For example, showing that some of our laws relate directly back to the Fugitive Slave Act. Wow. Or, you know, that that we can trace those, like the laws that that, uh, bounty hunters rely on. Those laws were drafted so that people could go around looking for slaves. Or saying that the police system, the patrol system we have, was originally a patrol for slaves, and free people of color to make sure they had paper on them if they were anywhere or had the right to be there because a white man signed a note of permission allowing them and also to pick up white trunks. So those are two, the mission initially. And put them in the paddy wagon. Put them in the paddy wagon. Which yeah. is named for Irish. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know if oh, the paddy. Yeah, we don't know if the paddy wagon was called that because the police were Irish or the drunks were Irish or both. Probably but, both. Probably that's both. That's hysterical. <laughs> it's called the Black Maria a lot too. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's sort of a mystery. But the critical race theory is that idea. And I like to connect it to critical biblical theory. There's a reason why I want to connect that. 
Spinoza back in 1670 started what we call biblical criticism by just saying, you know, in Judaism, we received this Torah and they say that it's just written down by Moses. God gave it to him. But there's all sorts of signs saying that there's something else that happened and there's some other aspect to it. Maybe we should start thinking about it. So this is the enlightenment, you know, the whole idea that the way we've discovered the heavens and the, the structure of the heavens and how things work by not receiving, taking the received tradition at literal face value, but by thinking about it, applying evidence and information and logic reason, we should be doing this to the Bible. And from that, he came up with the idea, well, no, it wasn't, there wasn't a single author. There were multiple authors and various periods of time. And if there was a single author, that meant he wrote over various centuries and decided to change which language he used. Uh, <laughs> right. And so these are things we accept now that most of us accept that the Bible is this compiled a canon of multiple fragmentary manuscripts, etc. But this whole idea is still opposed vehemently wow. by fundamentalists who believe that God is the single author, but he used these various people. But they don't like to look at within each gospel, for example, looking at the evidence that these gospels don't have a single author like Mark or Luke but they're compiled documents and they don't like to look at the historical documents when church officials got to in big conclaves and discuss, well, what are we going to put in? What are we going to leave out? Because somebody had to make the decision. So I think this resistance to looking at anything that we rely on, that we have a system that we received as the way to look at the world, the way to understand the world, you're going to see the same suspects come out and oppose it. And I think this is what has happened to critical race theory. If you generalize it to the idea that looking at racial issues from a systemic, comprehensive point of view to the fullest extent possible, there's great opposition to it because it opposes a basic meaning systems in Western society. And have they found that the people who are established as CRT professionals. And I think it is, has become sort of a profession. In fact, I'm surprised I don't see a trademark after it, CRT trademark. <laughs> there probably is one somewhere, somewhere. When, somewhere when they're teaching. I think when they're teaching attorneys CRT, there is probably a, you know, a codified trademark copyrighted system. But generally, I think that the approach has some things that are definite enough that we could describe them. And I think it is true that many of these ideas come from applying social psychology, the ideas that come from Marxism and Freudian psychology, history, and especially history from the standpoint of history, not just as stories, but as diverse ways of looking at the origins of things other than just the given one, the given origin. And some of the ideas, the controversial ideas that come out of that is sort of an assertion that racial preference for whites in America and oppression and stigmatization, stigmatization of blacks and natives was foundational to American law and mores and remains integral to our culture. In other words, it was that way from the beginning and so it is now. So as part of that, there's a tension that the CRT people will pay to our systems as to how they tend to be bulwarks against progressive change for minorities. In other words, and, they tend to maintain the status quo. And that's why they're banned? That's a reason to ban them in like all these different states? No, I think I'm just trying to outline some of the, the, some of the aspects. There are some others that are more provocative, I think. Okay, okay. One is the rejection of colorblindness. The colorblindness yeah. does not tend to help remove discrimination or prejudicial effects, and that you have to pay attention to color in order to, or someone's race or ethnicity, in order to make sure that there's some level of fairness. It's sort of the idea that treating the wolf and the lamb in the same way, giving them the same diet, is probably not a good idea. Colorblindness in terms of the law or in terms of just as a co-worker 
I reject colorblindness. It takes people like five seconds to figure out who the white guy is in the room and to pretend that you're white and the other person isn't is just silly. I think in the terms of, I think that is silly, but I think in terms of, although some, there are a lot of people who claim they're colorblind and they pr- mm. they're proud of it. I think CRT and movements like it have led those people to be more embarrassed, you know, to say that because it does run against common sense. But saying that the law should be colorblind, if you take that principle to some extreme, then there would be a sense that you shouldn't even look at how the law is differentially affecting people. Right. And for example, if you set a bail bond at a certain price for certain kinds of offenses, and then it becomes obvious that people who are poor or marginal cannot meet that price, and then they get continually charged additional fines and eventually end up in jail. If you don't want to look at all that this is affecting poor and often people of color, then your colorblindness is actually being very destructive because the court is setting that bond to make sure that somehow you're you're under pressure to show up and to show that you're not a scofflaw. And if you can't pay the bond at all, it's already set you up for a failure. So I think that's a case. I don't know how to fix that, by the way, but at least it should be something that the court system and legal system should be looking at. And if, if you go for colorblindness as a way to manage policy, it's going to create many cases where there's a negative implications. But whatever, uh, whatever critical race theory is, it certainly does seem to get a lot of people's backs up in the states that Steve listed before and others. In September of 2020, then President Donald Trump said he would create a commission to promote, quote, patriotic education and announced the creation of a grant to develop a, quote, pro-American curriculum. In the speech, President Trump decried what he saw as a twisted web of lies being taught in U.S. classrooms about systemic racism in America. He said, quote, teaching this horrible doctrine to our children is a form of child abuse in the truest sense. For many years now, the radicals have mistaken Americans' silence for weakness. They're wrong. There is no more powerful force than a parent's love for their children. And patriotic moms and dads are going to demand that their children are no longer fed hateful lies about this country. End quote. What twisted web of lies could he have been talking about? And how does CRT differ from American history presently taught in schools? Well, I think as it was presently being taught, probably soon before Trump wrote this, probably not very differently. In other words, CRT is not being taught in schools, except for if if you're in the law school and you take a course. Essentially, nothing much has changed. Are there people who would like to have a more systematic, aggressive kind of indoctrination about these issues toward a more liberal side? Yes. And there are people who have the opposite. And that's always been the case. And that's usually been settled in the textbook. And the last time I was aware of it, most school systems, as they approve textbooks, they end up very, very conservative. So Mm. many textbooks, for example, until maybe the last decade, had a few pages about what slavery was. And quite a bit about the Civil War, of course, but not much about. And the trend of wanting children to learn what slavery was like, well, that would probably be resisted. But is that CRT? I don't think so. It's it's an idea of education that says that education just isn't learning facts and opinions, but having some felt sense or some emotional idea of what our past is like and how it's affecting us now. And there are people who won't like that. And that's true of any topic you choose. If you want to talk about teaching children 
sex education and you get into any of the emotional aspects of that or interpersonal aspect, you're going to get resistance to how that's being done. And I think the people have reacted against the anti-CRT movement have made the mistake, uh, like, for example, the, the Democratic candidate for governor in Virginia that made the comment that parents shouldn't be controlling what their children are taught in school. Well, I can't think of a more stupid thing to say. I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you really want to fight, that's how to do it. You know, if you really want to be seen as ridiculous. Well, John McWhorter, the author, commentator, mm -hmm. he said CRT has been extended to a whole education school philosophy. And I personally know a middle school teacher who more or less says the same thing. In other words, if you were taught a CRT kind of course or curriculum, when you're trained to be a teacher and you bring that into the classroom. So I think that's what McCorder is talking about. Do you agree? To, are, are the tenets of CRT being taught without it actually being called critical race theory for 10 year olds? Well, I don't, I don't agree. I, I think what has happened is that there's been a change in awareness of context and knowledge about our past and how our systems work, and that well-educated people come into teaching jobs and other jobs informed by that. And we have a different thread in our culture where people oppose that kind of contextualization and that kind of analysis. And that those people have, I think they have a foot on, on solid ground in a way, and that many of these attempts to contextualize and analyze take it to the extreme. By the extreme, I mean they imply and act as though nothing else is to be taken into consideration, and they're overconfident and over-embracing in their analysis and contextualization but I think it's just from the fact that sensibilities and awareness has changed and it's changed in a way that are more conservative and even reactionary parts of society don't like it. And in fact, the attack on CRT and on wokeness, and we could probably talk about what that means. I think it's an attack on that sensibility that it's a way of saying that that should be banned. And I think it should be compared to the teaching of Darwinism. You know, when Darwinism eventually carried the day scientifically, are those people knocking it now scientifically? And those people tend to be as associated with, even those scientists tend to be associated with fairly conservative religion, but they have evidence. But, yeah, but, they, but we have the, the Scopes monkey trial. I mean, come on. <laughs> Exactly. It's the Stokes trial was all about does current knowledge and the current way of, of understanding and textualizing the world scientifically, should it be admitted in our schools? And a lot of people said no. Right. right. And they fought it and fought it and fought it. And they fought it until it became less of an issue because there were more people saying, oh, we're not going to ram this down your throat, but we're going to emphasize that there really is no war between science and religion in regard to this way of looking at how we got to be here. And ultimately that carried the day. But see, I, I've heard parents say, I'm not that I interviewed them, but I saw them on TV and I've read quotes saying things like, I don't want something taught in school that will make my child feel bad about himself. Is this a question of a, of a child's self-esteem or is it dog whistle racism being repeated? Well, I, I can give you a personal experience. When I was in school, we had to read Huckleberry Finn. I had to sit and listen to people talking about nigger Jim. And every time someone said nigger Jim, they'd look around over at me. <laughs> oh, and God. I had to, to <laughs> sing songs like Old Black Joe, which celebrates <laughs> a black slave who was like the family dog and then people loved him <laughs> or swanee river these are things i remember you know most clearly and one that irks me now was john brown's body is a moldering in the grave we had yeah. to sing that 
And I thought, well, what is this? John Brown. And I think I asked some, some teachers, so he was an insane man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. He was an insane man who, who helped provoke the, the slaves. The, 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 oh the, my god. Yeah, the Civil War. But he really <laughs> believed in his cause. So I was okay, that's why you're singing the song about him. Weird. Um, wow. So uh, you know, I think this isn't often taken from what was traditional, like say night before 1970, is full of all sorts of racist stuff. Yeah. If, for example, in courses now if this issue of crt is discussed at all it's going to put a huge amount of pressure on the students of color in the classroom if it's discussed in the classroom but that's usually not going to be considered it's going to be considered that some white children might feel badly about themselves and if you face some of the facts of our history, some people are going to feel bad about it, and some people will want them to feel bad about it. And I think the civil rights movement and Black advocacy as a whole has moved away from using guilt and shame as primary leverage, you know, the moral leverage, moral superiority that we, quote unquote, people of color can always grab the moral high ground. And I think that this is something that people perceive in CRT and they take exception to it. They don't like it. And I think that if you look at any aspect of American history and say, for example, our Declaration of Independence, when it says we the people, it meant we the white people. We the white men. We, we, we need the, the white yeah, men with yeah, money, yeah, who own property or at least have property or guns. <laughs> Even that early, it was like if you have land or guns, you can vote. If you're a white male, if you're anybody else, you can't. And to point that out is painful. If you have promoted a myth that something else was going on, yeah, that when they said we the people, they meant all of us. That was a much more comfortable myth. Yes. And I think when you, when any way that that's undermined, it's going to cause problems. And I think it is true that some children are going to be distressed to find out the truth because of the myths they've been told. And they'll need to find a way to construct another narrative, another understanding of what their country is and who their heroes are. And they'll find another way to understand who their parents are. And I can say that, for example, I think for many African-American children over the generations, when we went to primarily white schools or schools where everything was designed around the white curriculum and white society, we were being taught that our parents didn't know anything, that they were ignorant, and that all of the correct sort of things would come from this kind of culture Whereas my parents, my parents went to all black school, Lincoln School in a little town in in, uh, Southern Illinois, and they had black teachers and they taught a pro African American curriculum. Why? Because they had children who they knew were gonna suffer incredible shocks and abuse and would have their self-esteem eroded and they needed it to be bolstered. Will school systems and parents have to at times bolster the self-esteem of white children by helping them reframe what our past has been like by helping them negotiate with their parents why and how their parents have certain attitudes they have and how they should view their parents yes they're going to have to have that struggle I think for one thing, and I think many Black people might feel this way and other other minorities, we've always dealt with these issues in educating our children in any environment that we didn't have direct control over. And of course, there are many white people who say, well, we want direct control of school systems. And they, in fact, have the right to set up private schools and just do that. They can be religious schools or elsewhere, but not with public money. Right. Right. And I think to build a greater union, that's what we're still, you know, like 
quote Lincoln and Obama. That's really what this is all about. The struggle is about and how to do it is messy and people get emotionally involved. But I think this whole CRT thing is being used to divide people, to obfuscate the issues. And I think there's power plays on each side, people who are promoting it or in favor of that kind of thing and the people who want to undermine it. Yeah. Henry, Professor Glenn Lowry, in a lecture called The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, talked about the notion of stigma as sociological prejudice interacted with a cognitive theory of the formation of belief. It's like implicit bias. How is this important? Well, you know, Lowry, he wrote a book called The Anatomy of Racial Disparity, Inequality, Racial Inequality. And he was saying, well, you can approach this issue from two points of view. You can approach it with a narrative that's a discrimination. In other words, there's disparity of outcomes because of discrimination. Black people are refused jobs, housing, and rejected for opportunities, et cetera. So you end up with a large degree of discrepancy and, and inequality. And the other one is the developmental narrative. And that would be that Black people are starting out, I'll put it in this, maybe in a way he wouldn't put it, starting out in a race 400 years behind the other guy. <laughs> so mm. when slavery ended, Black people had little wealth because a day earlier they were wealth. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and in wow. fact, if, if you look at... I had the opportunity, sort of strangely by accident, to for the first time see Confederate money on the internet. And one of the Confederate bills in circulation is a bill with a group of four or five Black people harvesting cotton. That was on the money, mm. showing where their wealth was coming from. And then another bill has a big plantation building. So not only did they have no wealth or very, very little wealth, they were wealth. and there was a general sentiment in the United States that the slave owners should get some compensation. Should we call it reparations? Mm. Should we get some compensation for losing their wealth? And after Reconstruction, that did happen. There was an admission that the slaves should get compensated with property. 40 acres land. of mule. Yeah. Yeah, land to take yeah. care of yourself. Do you have a start? Well, some people got that, and then it was confiscated. Right. So that's the developmental starting point. But then you have the developmental accumulation of things like education. I'm the first person in my family to get a college education. Wow. So that's a lot of years, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm also the first to get a PhD. But... That's not true with every Black family. But let's say someone in my position, situation, I have education, I've had a pretty good income. Many people, African-American families who are in the same financial situation as white families, at least in terms of income, usually have two things. They don't have inherited capital. They don't have a home. Not only don't they inherit money from their parents and relatives, they pay for their funerals out of pocket wow. more often. That's why you'll find many Black families that are barely making it will be paying some sort of insurance, inflated insurance policy, because they don't want their children to have to pay to bury them because it's too frequent an event. I buried two of my uncles or helped my brothers and sisters do that. What's the best predictor of who will have? It's what their parents had is the power of compound interest. Mm. Uh, not only that, that's a developmental thing. If, if you have that in the beginning, you can get more of it. But we have repeated situations in our history where something like the Black towns in Oklahoma or in Florida, Black Wall Street in Topeka, that these places, once they were wealthy, they were targeted and destroyed. Right. It wasn't that they were vulnerable because the economics was poor, or the people had poor reasoning. 
they were attacked and killed and their wealth taken. And this has been a recurrent thing. Our last big crash due to inflated mortgages, primarily, oftentimes it was blamed on people of color getting houses they couldn't afford. But who sold them that? Who sold them those mortgages that they did not know about? And in fact, the evidence is that if you were Black and could afford a cheaper mortgage, Wells Fargo wouldn't sell you that mortgage. They, In fact, they had to settle for, I think, $180 million. They would sell the Black person the mortgage for someone who had poor credit. Brother. Redlining. Man. So we can talk about that. So that, those all affect developmental issues. But then there's another theme of, theme of development is if you don't have the skills and the values to be successful in a capitalist culture, you're not developed in that way, you will also be behind. And ultimately that involves things like having values, like I will spend more time reading and studying than I will spend playing basketball. Mm. <laughs> and where does that value come from? It comes from the fact that you've seen it rewarded. Right. We talked about John Mc, McWhorter. McWhorty, yeah. is that how he pronounces yeah. his name? McWhorter, I don't know. McWhorter, yeah, yeah McWhorter. Yeah. He's a linguist, and he points out in some of his lectures is that there should be no standard English. Hmm. As long as people can understand you. We don't have a Black English dialect that no one can understand. You know, it's not like sub-dialect of Basque in Spain. <laughs> no one can right. understand it. Right. You can yeah. understand it, which is proven by, you know, how white kids have picked up hip-hop, etc. But it is stigmatized. And when they're saying you talk like a white kid, they're not saying that you're not intelligent or you don't you understand the mainstream. They're saying you're adapting the, the value system that the language we speak in every day is shameful and substandard. And we don't believe that. We believe it's better. And that there's some shame and something wrong with taking the way they speak, people who oppressed us, and seeing that as superior. And in fact, from a linguistic point of view, that's true. Now, can you show up at a job interview and do it in the most extreme kind of Black English? Well, you can, but you're not going to get the job. And that's true everywhere in the world. Depends on, the, depends on the job. But yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to be a bank teller or something, yeah. I mean, that's, you're you, probably not going to get the job. No. If you want to be a hip hop artist, maybe you'll get the job. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> or if you want to be a, a representative for Black Americans being interviewed for their opinions by national television, you'll get that job. You'll be interviewed right. because they want to hear somebody who sounds Black. They don't want to hear somebody who doesn't sound Black. We've been talking with psychologist Henry Richards on critical race theory and related subjects. We're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're having a conversation about CRT with psychologist Henry Richards. Henry, in her book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, Isabel Wilkerson maintains that racial disparity in America is part of a caste system. Would you comment on this idea? Yeah, I, I would say that we know the caste system from India basically is the clearest one that we are aware of. And they have a group called untouchables. They're at the bottom. They have a society that's very regimented. And you, you inherit your place in the caste system. There are other places in the world have clear caste systems. I happen to live and work in Nigeria for a while. I'm very involved in Nigerian culture. And there's a society there, the Igbo society. They have a caste where there is an untouchable group called the Osu. The Osu are people who are made holy to a shrine. And then forever, their children are made holy to the shrine, which means they can't have normal intercourse in society. They can't cut their hair, can't marry people who aren't Osu. So that's the most extreme form. But in America, being Black and maybe Native has been closer to this untouchable status than Americans ever feel comfortable with. And that is that there's a shame, there's a stigma 
that uh, Glenn Laurie talked about, the stigma of being Black, which is different from the developmental theme. It's different from the discrimination. It's a more thing that affects how people see you and how you see yourself. And I think it's true that we've had a caste system, sort of a coloredtocracy, pigmentocracy, not just in terms of control and power, but in terms of how people's basic humanity is evaluated. And that's why Lowry prefers anti-stigma instead of anti-discrimination. It's a, as a concept, as a root. Yes, I think he believes there's not a lot of discrimination going on. Mm. And to the extent it goes on, it operates through stigma. Yeah. And if you could reduce the stigma, you'd reduce that element of discrimination. And one way of dealing with that stigma is to try to help people have less of a motive to project it or to rely on it, to increase self-esteem and self-understanding more generally would be one way to do it. But I think that it's hard to break through a caste system when the material circumstances are the same. In other words, in India, even when the untouchables still have nothing, when the religious system still says they're at the lowest realm, that's a problem. I happen to be wearing, and this is accidental, I'm wearing a t-shirt, a bright orange t-shirt that was developed by Charles Johnson, who's a fiction writer, African-American fiction writer, who's translated the Buddhist texts into the language spoken by the untouchables. And he spends a lot of times going there, working with them, and trying to get them to leave Hinduism and take on Buddhism or some other religion, because the Hindu system says that they should be at the bottom and they shouldn't be touched. So he's taken this practice, as a Buddhist, taken this practical thing of provide them with the scripture in their language and encourage them to think you don't have to be at the bottom. And here's a religious system that's or not really religious system. Here's a belief system that says you don't have to be at the bottom. But as long as they're at the very bottom, he's not getting converts from the people who have an income of less than 40 cents a day. Mm. Right. That's not who's going to convert because they look at their own life and they realize, hey, I am at the bottom. You know, my job is to, to take the shit out of the streets in a bucket every night. And that's the way it was. My father did it. It's OK. Right. Someone making a dollar and a half a day starts to reconsider their plight. And I think this, we have the same situation here that as our material circumstances become more similar our development becomes more similar. And I think we'll have less of some of this need to rely on stigma. Hmm. Henry, in the past 60 years, there have been legal reforms that expanded existing rights and provided more pathways for victims of discrimination to receive remedies. Why is it that racial inequality endures and persists even decades after these laws have been passed? Well, there's, there's, several things. I and mean, we talked about this developmental narrative or stream of things, which accounts for much of it. We talk about stigma and how stigma is difficult to quantify. And most of those laws require that someone shows in court that there was an intent. There are cases where intent doesn't have to be shown, but if there's enough of a difference in differential impact that some sort of legal action can be taken. But usually if there's an individual, I, I've had several situations in my life where I've had to threaten to sue people and one where I have to actually sue people. And the issue eventually was, did they intend to hurt you? Mm. Right. Well, I don't know. The guy grabbed me, choked me, threw me in the ground, beat me up, but he didn't intend to hurt me. He intended to get my wallet. <laughs> Wow. So, you know. well, your mind, your superhero mind reading powers were diminished at that point, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but proving intent is one of the issues. The other thing is different administrations have done different things. The fact that Clarence Thomas and Condoleezza Rice were in charge of the Equal Rights Office 
for years can tell you that they weren't aggressively pursuing discrimination suits. They really didn't believe in it. They were from an elite and they had a philosophy that said, well, pull yourself up by the your bootstraps. There's just too much complaining. And I think Glenn Laurie and McCarthy tend to be in that school as well. You should be pulling yourself up by your bootstraps because we did or but, someone did in our families. They sound a little like Bill Cosby to me. And I'm not saying they sound like rapists, but Cosby was certainly on the soapbox for many years, making very much the same kind of statement that you should be taking care of yourself. And I, I don't think he was 100 percent wrong, but it was preachy. It was like enough already. Well, I think it was that he did that because he thought that a broader American society needed to hear a prominent black person say this. Mm -hmm. And he got a lot of kudos for it and was considered brave. I don't think it was very brave. I think he was preaching to the choir. I don't think that black in black society, people were thinking that it was good for teenage girls and preteen girls to have sex and, and have babies or for boys to wear their pants below their ass, <laughs> this sort of thing, uh, or to use drug. No, no one really believed that. But America needed a black person to say it. And at that time, he was a symbol of some prominent. He was likeable, beloved. Yeah. He, oh, oh, he was, he and, was beyond. And now likeable. in the age of Me Too, when we have so many rapists out there, he's become the symbol of rape, which yeah. that shows stigma. Why him? And when we look at the symbol for injustice in the legal system, it's OJ Simpson. This is again stigma. So a problem is best accepted if it's a black face. This is true of illness too. HIV, right. it's more ex acceptable. Omicron, have you heard of this? Sure, new variant? absolutely. Yeah. It's being called the South African variant, Perfect. although the first true case was found in Belgium. Oh my God. And it is quite likely we're going to discover that the original cases in Botswana, not South Africa, they sent the materials that they found. South Africa has a highly technical society. They were able to turn around and do the gene sequ sequencing there. It's highly likely that those cases didn't come from Southern Africa. They came from Europeans. Yeah. But the face of that illness, there's an attempt to make the face a face of color, Chinese, right. in this case, African. And I don't believe when a new variant was found in Italy that all of a sudden, very quickly, everyone cut off travel. It's when their cases got very high, when it got out of control. That there were... So I think we see this stigmatization internationally. It's still an international racist system. And I know that this is the thing that CRT says, that there is a international system and we see the system in place in the United States and the various forms we have in our society. And we can argue if that's true or not. I think there, that argument will probably be in play until these sort of racial dynamics are less prominent. And now that'll, that'll happen when, they're, when economies become and you know li living conditions become more equivalent, I think. I hear McCorder saying... Well, that was true back in 1960, but it's not so much true today. He seems to be saying, yeah, we're past that. Mm -hmm. Not that there aren't problems, not that one third of the African-American population is living in poverty that has to be addressed, but we need practical solutions, not mm -hmm. vilifying college professors. Well, I suggest that he on a hot day in Georgia, go for a run in the neighborhood. <laughs> yes, that's, that's and past, past the Nick Michaels house. <laughs> commits the crime of a black man running down the street. Yeah. And this is, this is so common. I think it's nonsensical to say this is a decline. When I lived in Maryland, uh, Silver Spring, you know Maryland. Yeah, place. absolutely. Um, a close friend of mine was a black psychiatrist reaching his, in his, reaching his 80s who only a few miles from his home was pulled over by the police at like 12 o'clock at night. And he's, he's driving a very, very expensive foreign vehicle. 
He's pulled out, he's dressed in a suit. He takes out his identification that shows that he lives only a few miles away. He's told to get down on the mud in the winter time, face down while he's searched and they investigate. Well, he spent a little time investigating and eventually allow him to leave. Mm -hmm. but, but they had the ability electronically to find out where does that car belong? Oh, it belongs only a couple miles away. Right. We don't like that a black man is driving it, but there's really no reason to stop it. The rationale they gave was there's been some suspicious activity and home invasions and you resemble the suspect. Well, there was a suspect, someone who's driving around in like a, a Porsche in the middle of the night going is to he, house to house. Is he 80 years old in a is suit? 80 years old in a suit. <laughs> yeah. Un, unlikely. So I, I don't think it's true. And, and on the other hand, I, I agree with people like McCarthy and Lowry that the frequency of these things is lower than before, you know. But I have to say, the only time I ever saw my father cry over some, something that wasn't directly in the families. He came home in our town and the police had stopped him right downtown, told him to get out, threw him on, on the ground for no reason. They couldn't yeah. even come up with a good reason. And he was crying and he said, I'm crying because if I did anything about that, I'd either be dead or I'll go to prison and I, my children won't have any way to, to live. Yeah. Has that happened to me? No. Uh, has it happened to people close to me? Uh, I'd say like, well, it happened, it happened to that psychiatrist. I have in my extended family, my wife has a fairly close relative who was killed by a police officer. Damn. Why? I don't know. Maybe I don't know all the details, but these things happen. And it's not so much that the frequency hasn't gone down, is that the origins of it are still active. Stigma, racism. And of course, anytime we start talking about the police, there's a whole other thing because the police, they have their own culture. We have to get into a long talk about, well, what is police culture and why does it exist that way? No, my, my nephew, who is black, was arrested in New York for shaking hands with somebody. He shook hands with somebody he knew, walked a block, got picked up immediately by police in a van, driven around, put into jail overnight, charged with drug dealing right and said you. well you could you could plea bargain down to a misdemeanor mm -hmm. of drug possession he didn't have drugs on him he had an empty molly capsule but he shook hands with somebody who the police were interested in for whatever reason and we had to fight it in court and it was pretty amazing sitting in that courtroom where the judge is white, the lawyers are white, the cops are white, the stenographer is white, and everybody else is black or mm -hmm. Hispanic. It was startling. And anybody with half a brain could look at that and say, well, what is this system we're talking What's about? What's wrong with this picture? Yeah, it was just it's so obvious. Now, my nephew got off on a technicality. Mm -hmm. We were ready to fight the damn thing. And it was outrageous what they were doing. But yeah, that's driving while black. Yeah, I know somebody who was DWB driving mm -hmm. a very expensive car through Stamford, Connecticut, and they just stopped him. What are you doing here? How dare you drive? How you know, again, well-dressed black businessman. Yeah, just stop him. Now, your story reminds me of something about being trained as a psychologist and one of the first PhD psychologists at University of Chicago wrote a book called Even the Rat Was White. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> wow. So, well, so let me ask you this now. The, the Supreme Court has ruled that the First Amendment does not provide protection for obscenity, child pornography, or speech that constitutes what has become widely known as fighting words. But the court has decided that the First Amendment provides less than full protection to libel, slander, speech that may be harmful to children, invasion of privacy, and fraud, but not for racist 
verbal assault. Why is racist verbal assault protected under the First Amendment? Well, I think it's generally protected, but I think there are situations where it would not be protected because it would become a threat. So in situations where a racial verbal assault implies a imminent threat, it's not protected. That's my belief. Yeah. If someone in a open meeting calls someone the N-word, that's protected. If someone pulls up to your car in the middle of the night at stop sign and calls you the N-word, that may not be protected. Oh. Because it's a realistic threat. In fact, with the way they're interpreting laws now, like you could probably pull out your gun and kill that person who's called you that name. Because you could say, realistically, I felt I was under threat. But you might feel under threat. I know for one example is that the court decided that you could not burn crosses on Clarence Thomas's lawn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he actually did make that comparison that, you know, there's some speech that should not be protected, that burning the cross anywhere near his lawn would not be protected. So those certain actions and representations, I think they're not protected. But it, it's a fine line. And, you know, I think it's correct that our legal system and culture is more prone toward letting people just sticks and stones can break my bones, you know, but words don't. But if you're calling me a bad name with a stick in your hand, that's a different, different story. You know, different right. matter. Henry, in a Washington Post article titled The Hidden Truth About Liberals and Affirmative Action, Richard Morin wrote, quote, surveys typically show that most political liberals and Democrats support affirmative action, while most conservatives and Republicans reject it. Paul Snyderman of Stanford University and Edward Carmines of Indiana University discovered that white liberals are just as angry about affirmative action as other whites. They're just less willing to admit it. Why are conservatives and liberals angry about affirmative action? Well, I think that study was another one of those studies that look at implicit biases that can be manipulated because what they did is they varied the order in which they either mentioned affirmative action or not. And they found mm -hmm. that more people didn't like it. But they also found that most people, whether conservative or not, were in favor of things that would be helpful to disadvantage people of color. But I think that the way you phrase things becomes important. And I think also any survey data, there's a whole world of the survey. In other words, when you take a survey, you enter the mindset of the survey. And I often don't tend to believe that it corresponds very well to behavior. People are often saying what they are expected, like let's say majority of Republicans believe that Trump didn't win the election. They don't. They don't believe that. <laughs> but they feel that I'm given a survey. My team says we don't, right. we believe he won. So if yeah. that's the way they support their team, we shouldn't take it like, oh, that means we have a crisis, extreme crisis of insanity where people don't believe what happened. Yeah, the color of your shirt has a lot to do. You know, I, as I remember having gone to Catholic school and walking home from school in our, our Catholic school uniforms, we were like a beacon, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like for the public school kids. They, oh, Rodney. look what's coming. You know, like, yeah, I think that you think you're absolutely right. It's like, whose team are you on? Oh, OK, we'll just adopt this particular uh, way of looking at things. So. What, in your opinion, is a stereotype, and how does it relate to what we were discussing? Well, you know, a stereotype, I think Glenn Lowry, actually, I mm -hmm. think he's really used this concept to great explanatory power, but it's the idea that by looking at someone's or taking in a few characteristics from someone, you can gain enough information to make decisions. So if there is a group, for example, that commits crimes 10% of the time and another group that commits crimes 90% of the time, 
you have some basis to see if you see members of that 90% group, you have some reason to think perhaps there's a higher probability that that person is going to commit a crime. Do you have any absolute prediction? No. And the reality is, in most of life's decisions, group differences are smaller than individual differences. In other words, the differences between groups really is much smaller. Like take, for example, drug use. We know that it's about the same in whites and blacks, but people have adopted the stereotype that blacks are gonna be more involved in it and then more involved in crime related to it. And they can make decisions based on that, like what happened with your nephew, I think it was your nephew. Yeah. So that's what a stereotype is. And basically it's a simplified, lazy way of thinking that I think tends to get us in trouble and cause trouble for people being stereotyped. But I wrote to you when we were kicking around some ideas and I said that in my experience, growing up in Baltimore, being taught to be a white supremacist mm -hmm. by my father, my grandmother, less so my mother, but that was the worldview. That's the way my family, especially on my father's side, saw the world. That in this view, there are different species and subspecies. They exist because that's the way of the world. It might be God's plan. That's the way it is. A quarter horse is good for sprinting and a draft horse is good for hard work. And you wouldn't use a quarter horse to pull a plow. And so you know, in this worldview, Africans have many good qualities like physical strength and they're good singers and dancers, but they are intellectually and morally inferior to Europeans and their descendants. And included in this narrative are these stereotypes of Africans as lazy and untrustworthy and superstitious and cowardly and unclean and hypersexual. And this is not evidence-based. This is not rational, but it would be irrational for a person living in a community of people who all believe this to stand up and say, well, you know, I think that Africans are equal to us. You'd be laughed out of the house or punished. My grandma was outraged if I said something like that. So it, what it means to me is that we're dealing here with racial bias that's mostly unconscious. It's something we learn in childhood. It's part of a worldview, a, a mental model that you carry around with you. How do we combat that? Well, I, I don't think I would give the answer that education is going to do it. Right. I think association helps. Right. Yes. When people uh, actually experience other people. Lowering the anti of being more tolerant and fair. In other words, people, if people feel like if I'm not racist or I'm not prejudiced, then the property values in my neighborhood are going to plummet when this black person moves in. Well, when you feel that the stakes are really high, like most of what your wealth is accumulated, wealth is going to be devastated. Well, you're likely to be motivated to be less tolerant. So to the extent that when you convince people that if Black people, I do focus this issue on Black people because I think it's, it's the most endangered group, but we can certainly focus on Native Americans in the same situation. If they get more, whites get less. Well, why is that? Why would that be true? Why would it be true if most of our military budgets is off budget, we don't even get to see it. Why would we believe that there's only enough wealth to go around that if there's some extra money to deal with the issues that our society has developed over you know hundreds of years, but have increased since the 1950s, have gotten worse. 
why would we believe that there's not enough wealth when we're the wealthiest country in the world? We don't have the highest standard of living. We we don't have the the, the highest oh, life expectancy uh, anymore, but we certainly have lots and a lot of money pouring in. Why is there the sense? And I think it's a sense of, well, if they get more, we get less. And politicians, demagogue, play up that idea while they're spending huge amounts of money on weapon systems that don't get used, on subsidies, you know, like paying farmers not to grow corn. I know there's probably some good rationale for that, but ultimately there must be something wrong with the scenario. You should pay them to grow something else, right? So I think that's part of it is like lower the ante, make it, make it more clear to people that there is not a win-lose scenario, that that's always not necessary. You know, I think as long as people are talking and have something that is substantial to talk about, and I think that's why I have a problem with the CRT, the way it's been discussed and the way it's being used and the term woke, is that people are, they're exchanging emotionally charged concepts, and they're not using concepts to actually discuss issues. They're using them almost as like ammunition or marks that they can hold against the other side. I guess in terms of CRT, there's one thing I probably should comment is on this word woke. Oh, yeah. um, I've been black most of my 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I've spoken some form of code switching is called with people who have another dialect switch back and forth. And I've done that most of my life, and less so in recent years. But I've never used the term woke the way this has been used. I never heard it used this way. I knew the term woke in the context of I'm woke to that. Okay, do you know that that, that, that guy down the corner is selling dope. I'm woke to that because I'm aware that's what he's doing. You know, I'm not asleep. It's usually in the context, I'll take care of myself because I'm aware. So it does have some origin in Black culture. But I think the way it's being used now is, for one thing, Black people stopped using it. Then it got picked up in the current context. And I think it's being used as a stigma. Yeah. That woke means rigid, intolerant ideologues who have picked up the CRT or related isms and look down on everyone else and want to impose this on everyone else. Well, there's a certain truth to that, that there being people like that. But I think by calling it woke, it conjures up the stigma of using a Black dialectical term. It's like, why don't we use ebonics? If you use the term ebonics, I don't know what it would mean if someone said about someone else, oh, you know, Jim, he speaks Ebonics. Ebonics pulls up this whole dialogue from the 1990s and early and early 2000s about whether Black English is a legitimate language. We don't talk about it anymore. And it's not that, it, that that language has gone away. We just say Black English or Black dialect or the non-standard English. And whether it should be called eubonics has been dropped because people felt like there was no political advantage and there was no real usefulness to it. And I think they became sensitive to by calling it ebonics and relating it to ebony. It had picked up sort of the some of the stigma of blackness. And I think this woke thing, you know, I think it's still being used that way. And when conservatives use it, they should be aware that they're conjuring up the stigma of blackness, but apparently even linguists like Orti don't seem to care. They seem to go ahead and use it because they know it bothers liberals, but part of what's happened is anything that really bugs liberals, then that's what certain conservatives are going to do and vice versa, probably. Although I think liberals tend to discount conservatives and they're sort of proud to just discount them. So they probably don't put as much energy in irritating them. That's a topic oh, for another show. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the religion of wokeism, which McWhorter is referencing in his, his book title, at least. Henry, you know, here at the Hub for Important Ideas, we're always trying to find hope because we're talking about a lot of less than uh, happy <laughs> topics sometimes. Difficult. 
difficult. That's good. Where in all this is there hope? Well, I had a situation in my neighborhood. I went to a True Value hardware store. I've been going there for 15 years. So one day I went to the owner. I said, yeah, I'd speak to the owner. He's, I said, you know, I've been here. I've been going here for 15 years. I've never seen a black person working here. Mm. And I've seen many black people and myself, and other people of color coming in, buying things. I've been treated like a thief several times in your store. Like I came in with a walking stick and one of your staff members came up to me and said, we have those there in the store. Did, did you pay for it? Mm. And I was like, oh, uh, don't you know me? I come in here all the time. So I, I said, can you tell me if you can do anything about that? Do you ever think about hiring somebody black? And the guy said, I don't have to. I, you know, I own the store. I said, yeah, I'm glad you own the store. That's why I'm talking to you. <laughs> and he got really angry. I said, well, you know, uh, please, it doesn't have to be an angry confrontational thing. I'm just asking you, is there something you could do? Well, you know, about a year later, I went in there and there was a young black man working there very dark skinned man. First I said, oh, you know, he went and hired an African because he doesn't want to hire African-American. I was wrong. He hired an African-American. And the kid worked there for, oh, about uh, eight months or so. And I ran into him. He left there and I ran into him in the grocery store. And I said, do you leave that place? And he said, yeah. And I said, you know, I wonder how was it working there? Because I noticed that no other black person ever worked there before. He said, well, it was pretty good. I, I just, I said, well, why'd you leave? He said, well, it didn't fit my school schedule anymore. So he had no no gripe about the place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but he did say, oh, yeah, that's true. I would never see anybody else black work in there. But I give that example in that I was able to talk to this guy and he was able to talk to me. Although initially it was a highly charged situation. I'm saying like, I come in here for 15 years and what do I see? And I have, have noticed that every couple seasons, he'll have some young men of color working during the, the Christmas season. They'll, they'll come in and work. Right. So people do change. And I guess what came out of that is actually that guy helped me with some home repair information, home renovation information that I didn't know. And he did it in a very, just a normal, amiable way after that discussion. So I think there are ways to handle this. And again, not that I always do these things in the best way. I try to present this to the guy is, hey, this doesn't have to be a win-lose. Like I have to force your hand and call the NACP to close down your store, and <laughs> call True Value corporate and get on your case. We can just try to talk about, well, what what's going on? Yeah. And, you know, he could have told me no Black people ever apply. And he didn't tell me that. <laughs> okay. Interesting. I think you've given us a lot to chew on, Henry. Thank you very much. Folks, we've been talking with Dr. Henry Richards about critical race theory and a whole lot of related topics. Henry, thank you for another terrific conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Henry, we hope you'll come back and talk to us again. You're one of our very favorite guests. Great. I like that. Oh, thanks. All right. Take care. You have been listening to an interview with psychologist Henry Richards discussing critical race theory, wokeism, racial prejudice, and discrimination in America and internationally. Ken, what's your takeaway? Well, Steve, I was serious when I said Henry is being one of our favorite guests. He's such a gentleman. I think it has to do with his work as a psychologist. He knows how to deal with all kinds of people. I'd gotten to know him about 11 years ago and have always enjoyed his company. What I like most about Henry is he understands the other point of view. Yeah, that's exactly right. He recognizes when something is bigotry, but treats it as a human trait. He compared criticism of critical race theory to rejection of Darwinism. Very insightful. Yeah, that was startling. Very clear and understandable point of view, even if you disagree with it. Right. He isn't filled with hatred and resentment. He's not naive or blind to the truth, but he's not filled with righteousness and rejection of anyone from the other side of the issue. He has understanding without being judgmental. Right. He's not about being right all the time. Yeah, he's doing what we've been trying to do for the last two years, bridge the divide in our fractured society. Yeah, just to recap a little, 
Critical race theory is this idea that we can approach racial issues in our society critically, which means comprehensively and systematically to understand where it came from, how it works, how it's perpetuated, and how it could best be changed. Henry's saying this conflict we're seeing now is nothing new. He asks, are there people who would like to have a more systematic, aggressive kind of indoctrination about these issues toward a more liberal side? Yes. And there are people who have the opposite. And that's always been the case. Yeah, unfortunately, always likely to be so. Mm. I I loved his telling us his personal experiences growing up, uh, reading Huckleberry Finn in school, singing songs like Old Black Joe and Way Down Upon the Swanee River. (laughs) It's sad, but you have to laugh at the absurdity of it. I went and looked up Swanee River, old folks at home. Yeah. Oh my God. I, I just, I, yeah, I had completely forgotten about what an incredibly racist song that is. Anyway, yeah. You saw his objective point of view when he said this whole CRT thing is being used to divide people to obfuscate the issues. And there's power plays on each side. Very true. Yeah, that's a critical piece of this. I love the line when he said, when slavery ended, black people had little wealth because a day earlier, they were wealth. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot to say in one sentence. He talked about the stigma of being black, how people see you and how you see yourself. Another term I liked, pigmentocracy, not just in terms of, (laughs) that's an amazing word. Yeah, that's great. That's a great great word. word. Not just in terms of control and power, but in terms of how people's basic humanity is evaluated. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement with him when he said, I think that woke is being used as a stigma. Woke has come to mean rigid intolerance. And as you and I have talked about many times, rigid intolerance is is no way forward for other sides to agree with each other. But he finds hope in interaction and communication. He thinks association helps. People actually experiencing other people. I've always felt this way. I believe integration, people living in the same community, working together, sharing common goals, is vitally important. Yeah, absolutely. Henry says, make it more clear to people that it's not always a win-lose scenario. As long as people are talking to each other and they have something that's substantial to talk about, there are ways to handle racial conflict. It doesn't have to be win-lose proposition all the time. Important ideas. Important ideas again. Thank you, Henry. Folks, join us next time. Like us on Facebook. Please recommend us to your friends. You can find us at www.thehubforimportantideas.com. And support us on Patreon at www.patreon.com front slash the hub important ideas. We are 100% listener supported. And please check out our documentary video series, Conversations with Solomon, Exploring Human Motivation, now on YouTube. Thank you for listening to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. Happy holidays, everybody. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Wait a minute. Do it again. Make, okay. make it sound good. If, all right. So uh, if okay. we're going to do this. Okay. Ready? Jingle bells, jingle. Okay. Jingle bells, jingle, okay. jingle, bells, let's, let's do it. Let's, jingle okay. all the way. Okay, let's count, we'll count down. Count down. Okay. Right. Three. All right. I'll go three, two, one, jingle bells. Okay. Three, right. two, one. Jingle bells. Jingle bells. <laughs> jingle bells. Jing- we have to come <laughs> Why in. do you keep we, laughing? Because- do we have to get through jingle all the way. I said. I'd rather sing Silver Bells, It's Christmas Time in the City. I love that song. Are gonna make, if you're going to force me to sing <laughs> I, a Christmas carol. I love that song. That's my favorite one. Right. Okay. Okay. Happy holidays, everybody. Silver bells. Silver, silver bells. bells. It's, it's Christmas, Christmas time, time in the city. In the city. <laughs> this there is, you go. This has been a contemporary heroism initiative production.